Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Underwood. I'd like to turn it over to our medical director, Dr. Brian Wood, to introduce our guest. Well, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Christine Udell Flores back with us for another presentation. Dr. Udell Flores is part of our expert panel here and is a psychiatrist here at Harborview, and I will turn it over to her. So um, we're going to talk today about um, HAND, or HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the assessment and um, diagnosis, diagnosis and then um, treatment issues. You know, when, when we're talking about HIV and cognitive deficits, we always worry about um, opportunistic infections, but there's also other things that we really have to rule out. Um, that can also present with cognitive changes or delirium. So that includes includes substance use, uh, both intoxication and withdrawal induced delirium or or um, cognitive disorders. It also includes psychiatric disorders, uh, specifically major depression and psychosis. Um, also, bipolar disorder can present with some cognitive changes in delirium. Then there's the metabolic and systemic disorders, um, such as B12 deficiency, uremia, things like that, hepatic encephalopathy. And then um, the opportunistic infections, systemic infections, brain tumors. And then there's also neurosyphilis, substance-induced dementia, vascular dementia, brain injury, and also Alzheimer's disease. You know, our, our population is getting older. I think the average age now of our HIV-positive patients is about 46. So as people get older, um, there's going to be more and more other reasons for cognitive decline, um, specifically vascular disease and Alzheimer's disease. And then, of course, we have to think about medication adverse effects as well that could cause um, cognitive changes. Now, as Bob Harrington talked about a little bit before, the pathogenesis of HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder it has to do all with the um, Trojan horse theory of HIV entrance into the CNS. So um, HIV enters the CNS within two weeks of primary infection. It crosses by uh, the blood-brain barrier by infecting monocytes, which differentiate into macrophages, which um, are there for a long period of time. Um, Cell-free virus can also enter um, by infecting endothelial cells and diffuses into the CNS. And then macrophages can also infect other cells in the CNS. Neurons don't become directly infected. However, the cognitive impairment is caused by gradually accumulating neuronal damage due to the direct toxic effect of viral proteins, as well as the chronic inflammatory process, the chronic immune activation process and production of cytokines that occurs when uh, people have HIV disease. So um, in this case, the longer they have HIV disease, the more likely they are to have accumulating damage to their central nervous system. Prior to use of um, highly active antiretroviral treatment, there was about a 20 to 30 percent uh, prevalence of advanced of HIV-associated dementia in those with advanced HIV. However, since um, most of our patients now are on heart, the incidence of HIV-associated dementia has dramatically decreased. However, the incidence of um, milder forms of HAND have increased, so up to 40% of patients, up to 50% in some studies uh, of these patients continue to suffer from some type of neurocognitive disorder. Um, the charter study looked at 1,500 patients on heart, and over 50% had HIV-associated neurocognitive deficits. However, only 2% of them had HIV-associated dementia, and the rest had a minor neurocognitive disorder and asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment. So this is sort of a, a picture of, of, the, of hand. And just to remind everyone, we used to call it AIDS dementia complex and minor neurocognitive motor disorder, but the new terminology is HIV-associated um, neurocognitive disorder with asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment, uh, mild neurocognitive disorder, and HIV-associated dementia. And those are the prevalences um, of each. Um, risk factors for HAND include the low CD4 count, and we particularly look hard when their CD4 count is below 200. 
Um, but another risk factor is the uh, levels of plasma viremia. So if patients aren't suppressed or if they have higher um, viral levels, that's um, a risk factor. And, and that correlates, of course, with the CSF viral load as well, which um, is a risk factor. We also um, um, document the nadir count because that also can predict um, development of neurocognitive deficits. Also, people with hepatitis C and active hepatitis B co-infection will have oftentimes a higher prevalence of hand. People who use methamphetamine, um, we have seen that they have higher um, amounts of neurocognitive deficits. And then other risk factors include aging, diabetes, and cardiovascular risk factors. It's important to remember that HIV dementia is a subcortical dementia. So the brain regions most commonly damaged include the basal ganglia, the hippocampus, deep white matter, and finally cerebral cortex. And it's really characterized by psychomotor slowing, um, as well as changes in mood, anxiety, and, and behavioral changes. There's also deficits in executive functioning, abstraction, information processing, psychomotor slowing, and um, attention and de decision-making problems. And um, it's also was noted um, that deficits in olfaction are also common in HIV-associated dementia, although you can see that in Alzheimer's as well and vascular dementias. So signs and symptoms include, uh, the first thing you might see is decreased attention and concentration and mood and personality changes. So patients will uh, appear sad, angry, irritable. They'll have emotional lability. They have apathy, fatigue, and social withdrawal, as well as psychomotor slowing, poor balance and clumsiness, and executive dysfunctioning. They also have visual spatial difficulties, so we usually test them by drawing a cube to see if that is um, expressed or not. And in the late stages, they have psychotic symptoms, more severe verbal memory uh, problems, seizures, and mutism. So um, there's two ways to diagnose this, to diagnose HIV-associated dementia. The first one is a clinical diagnosis, and that's when the patient displays two or more of the following cognitive symptoms for greater than a month, and they're listed there. And they also have an acquired abnormality in motor function, a decline in motivation, emotional control, or social behavior, and their symptoms have to cause moderate to severe deficits in their activities of daily living. With um, the diagnosis of mild neurocognitive disorder, they also have to show two or more of the following symptoms for greater than a month, but they only need mild to moderate impairment in daily functioning and ADLs. Now, if the other way of diagnosis is by um, doing uh, formal neurocognitive testing, for the diagnosis of HIV dementia, they have to have greater than two standard deviations below the mean scores in two different cognitive domains, as well as moderate severe deficits in ADLs. Well, MND is only greater than one standard deviation below the mean and mild ADLs, and then asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment is just simply mild neurocognitive disorder without any ADL deficits, so the patient isn't aware of their symptoms. Now, um, we do screening tests, and um, the first one um, that is recommended is the HIV dementia scale. It's 80% sensitive, 91% specificity. It's validated in English and Spanish. Um, it's a little hard to administer in the clinical setting unless you've been trained to administer it because you have to look at antipsychotic eye movements and, and things like that. It's a little hard. You can, we can learn how to do it. But we also have the modified HIV dementia scale where we take out that um, particular test and we just do the memory registration. So we give them four words, four simple words. We ask them to repeat them and remember them. Then we um, test their psychomotor speed, and we ask them that way. I ask them usually to write the alphabet in uppercase letters horizontally across the page as legibly, as quickly and as legibly as possible, and then I record the time. And so if, it's, if they can do that in less than 21 seconds, they have no impairment, and you score according to um, how many seconds it takes them. 
Then after that, you just ask um, what were the four words that you wanted them to remember. And you can give one point for each word recalled and half a point for recall after prompting. And you prompt um, by specifically saying, okay, an animal, dog, a piece of clothing, hat, a vegetable, bean, and a color, red. So you prompt that way, and then they can get half a point if they remember after prompting. And then you have them copy a cube. Um, and record the time, and it has to be under 25 seconds in order to get the full score. So the full score is 12, and anything less than 7.5 means possible HIV-associated dementia. And then you can refer for further neurocognitive testing, as well as perhaps doing an MRI, um, which is part of the full uh, workup, and ruling out other causes of dementia or delirium. An LP can also be done. Um, that's Debatable if you want to do that or not, but um, a lot of people recommend doing that for a full workup. For people who have less schooling or have English as a second language, you can do the International HIV Dementia Scale. And um, this scale has been validated cross-culturally. I think they tested it in people in um, Nigeria or Uganda. Again, they do memory and registration with the four simple words to recall. Um, they test motor speed by having the patient tap the first two fingers of the non-dominant hand as widely and as quickly as possible. Okay, so my right hand is my non-dominant hand, and this means the first two fingers, and you have to tap them. So you spread them as wide as possible, and you tap as quickly as possible. And they have to do 15 in five seconds to get the full four points. Then um, you test psychomotor speed by having them perform certain movements, again, with their non-dominant hand as quickly as possible. So they're to clench the fist on a flat surface, then they put their palm flat on the surface, and then they put their hand perpendicular to the flat surface. You have to demonstrate that to them and have them perform twice for practice, and they have to do four of these, in 10 seconds. So like that, right? And um, to get the full, um, the full uh, score. And then, of course, then you ask them to recall the words. The maximum score in this is 12, and scores under 10 should be evaluated further for possible HIV-associated dementia. So these um, are very easy scales to do. Um, you can see yourself doing it, you know, as long as you have a, either a stopwatch or a, or a good watch with a second hand, you should be able to do this in, within a few minutes, um, five minutes maximum um, in the office. And um, there's another test that they often do, the mental alternation test. And this is real simple. You ask the patient to count to 20, then they ask them to say the alphabet, and then they're supposed to alternate between numbers and letters. So 1A, 2B, 3C. And they, the score is just the number of correct alternations in 30 seconds. So any score under 15 means uh, the need for further testing. And then the MOCA also is pretty good. It tests, you know, visual spatial. It tests, it doesn't test psychomotor slowing as much, however, but it um, tests executive functioning. And so that's supposed to be better than the mini mental status exam. Um, and then, of course, you can just ask three simple screening questions. Um, asking if they have frequent memory loss, asking if they feel they're slower when planning activities, solving problems, or thinking things out, asking them if they have difficulties in paying attention. So to differentiate HIV-associated dementia from Alzheimer's, remember that HIV-associated dementia is more likely to present with initial behavioral changes in psychomotor slowing. It also progresses more rapidly and can be associated with CSF findings. But it's not as well associated with aphasia because that doesn't really occur until the more severe dementia. And aphasia and Alzheimer's disease would be, is what starts off with, and with patients. There's also some international consensus guidelines. Basically, um, they recommend that all patients with HIV be screened to assess neurocognitive functioning during the first six months of their diagnosis, and that if they are a high-risk group, they should be monitored every 6 to 12 months. And the frequency of monitoring can be increased in those with neurocognitive decline, in those who are not on heart, and in those who have incomplete virologic suppression. 
Um, the comprehensive neuropsych eval is the standard for evaluation, and then the MRI and LP are part of the complete evaluation as well. In terms of treatment, the treatment is heart. Um, and of course, um, that's both used for treatment and prevention of hand. Um, and they, there's the CNS penetration effectiveness scores that people are starting to measure. So certain viral agents are, are better for CNS penetration. However, we really have not um, completed all of the um, testing necessary to validate if it is effective or not. Um, there is a large, however, multi-clinical site study um, underway right now. Then there's psychiatric medications such as SSRIs um, or bupropion for comorbid depression, anxiety. Stimulants have been used at low doses to help manage symptoms of fatigue, decreased con concentration, and memory deficits among those with dementia. Then there's also antipsychotic medications for agitations, hallucinations. We don't recommend benzos because of increased confusion and decreased concentration. And um, then there's the non-pharmacological management, including structured routines, good nutrition, minimizing use of alcohol and drugs. And then, of course, adherence to medical regimens is compromised, so we have to assist patients in being able to do that. There's some potential adjunctive therapies that are under study right now. One being an NMDA antagonist, Namenda or Mamantine. Really, um, other medications for like Alzheimer's disease is not um, really effective, but memantine may be effective. Also, antioxidants such as selegiline and anti-inflammatory agents such as minocycline, and they're studying those right now.